All right, how's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Thursday, August 18th, 2022, and we are live. Just popping on for a few minutes here to uh, tell you about the uh, online course that I teach normally on Saturdays, but we're doing a special session here on Thursday. We're going to do it. Uh, it's going to start about 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to start a uh, few minutes as soon as I get finished with this broadcast. Uh, we're going to do another session of ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And we deal with thousands of years and what leads up to uh, the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So um, in the last class we did, we dealt with some of the history of the Moors going into the Iberian Peninsula that they know on the Spain of Portugal, uh, 711 AD, and they go in uh, under uh, General Tarif in 710 AD, and then General Tariq uh, Ibn Ziyad goes into 711 AD uh, and, and conquers uh, the southern portion of uh, the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, so we do, so uh, in today's class, uh, we're going to get into um, more dealing with Christopher Columbus. We'll talk some more about the Moors. We'll deal uh, some more with Christopher Columbus and uh, uh, why Columbus uh, set sail on his four voyages August 3rd, 1492, when he set sail on the Nina de Penta and the Santa Maria. We'll continue uh, this history chronologically. We go through and look at thousands of years of history, and we look at this history chronologically, and we see uh, what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade uh, taking place. Okay, so I uh, do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips. Uh, you know, last class we talked about uh, General Tariq Ibn Ziyad. We talked about uh, Saint Maurice. And we dealt with uh, the origin of the word more, and we dealt with uh, the word Maurice. It also is in reference to a Moorish boy. Uh, we talked about Marie, Mauritania. And Mauritania meaning land of black skinned people. We dealt with how St. Maurice became a patron saint uh, to Germany um, as well when his uh, troops refused to um, kill the Christians. Uh, so we dealt with a lot of this history here, and uh, we also, also talked about the uh, national flags of Corsica and Sardinia that have the African Moors heads uh, on them also, okay, and and why they have those African Moors heads on them. Um, we're going to, when we look at uh, Christopher Columbus, it's, it's important to understand that Columbus never came to the land that we call the United States of America. The closest he came here is Cuba, which is 90 miles away. And we know that Columbus was also using nautical instruments that the Moors are going to, uh, based upon technology, the Moors are going to introduce into Europe as well. Okay. So everything we taught uh, the Europeans came back uh, to kick us in the behind. And when you look at where Columbus went on his four voyages, he goes into uh, the Bahamas, or what he calls San Salvador, August 3rd, 1492. We know this is uh, late in the same year that uh, the uh, Moors lose control of their last stronghold in Spain, which is Granada, uh, January 2nd, 1492. And uh, he also goes into Cuba and Hispaniola. We know the western portion, uh, the western third of the island of Hispaniola is where you have the... Uh, uh, Haiti, okay, the Haiti, and we know the French are going to take control of Haiti in 1697 from the Spanish, and we know you're going to have the Haitian Revolution that starts in 1791. Um, and then in the second class that I teach, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968, normally we teach that class on Sundays. Um, in that class, we deal with the Haitian Revolution and the Louisiana Purchase, because those two events are connected okay um september 1493 columbus goes into the west indies and Boricuan or puerto rico he goes into jamaica in 1494 we know the british are going to take control of jamaica from the spanish and you're going to have in the 1800s you're going to have queen nanny and the jamaican maroons fighting against the british um 
Third voyage, May 1498. He goes into Trinidad and Venezuela mainland, South America. Uh, fourth voyage in uh, 1504, his, his uh, fourth and last voyage, 1504, he goes into Panama and Honduras, okay? So the closest Columbus comes to this land is Cuba, which is 90 miles away. And Colum the contract that he had with Queen uh, Isabella and King Ferdinand of Spain allowed him uh, to keep 10% of whatever riches he found, along with the noble title of govern, uh, the, along with the noble title and the governorship of any lands he should encounter. That title was Admiral of the Ocean Seas, Admiral of the Ocean Seas. Now, uh, according to Dr. David M. Hotel, who wrote the book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, who's a friend of mine, I've interviewed him probably, I think, about 13, 14 times, something like that. Um, in his book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence, um, he talks about how 70% uh, of the people Columbus encountered on his four voyages were African people, because African people were already in uh, the Caribbean, even before Europeans got there. Um, Africans were already there in, in, some of those, in some of those island nations. Uh, now, Ptolemy de las Casas, who travels with Columbus on some of his voyages, right, Reverend Bishop Ptolemy de las Casas, who was going to be instrumental in uh, the African, uh, instrumental in um, Africans uh, only being, or uh, Africans exclusively being enslaved by the Spanish. Um, he estimated that uh, Columbus was responsible for the uh, murder of 12 million to 25 million indigenous people, 12 million to 25 million indigenous people. Okay. So in our next class, we're going to look at some excerpts of, uh, Christopher Columbus and the African Holocaust slavery and the rise of European capitalism by, uh, Dr. John Henry Clark, uh, as well. That's one of the books that we reference, uh, in the class. You don't have to buy any of these books to follow along, uh, in the class. We show you those excerpts. Uh, usually uh, of the books. Okay, so we go through and look at thousands of years of history. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them uh, anytime. And this is just a very, very short timeline of history. There's a much more extensive timeline of history that we look at that looks at thousands of years of history. But we look at uh, 1419, Prince Henry, the navigator of Portugal, begins sending expeditions to explore the West African coast. 1441 between right around 1441 actually some sources say 1444 others say 1441 portugal starts to buy africans from uh the west that from west africa and establishes the first leg of what becomes known as the triangular trade and the triangular trade is really formulated by great britain when great britain gets involved in the transatlantic slave trade in 1615 in, in 1562 with sir john hawkins um and you're going to have anton Gun Anton Gonzalez, Portuguese, who basically uh, we look at the start of the transatlantic slave trade with uh, him going into Mauritania in 1441. Uh, the Doctrine of Discovery of Dumb Diverses, 1452. The Papal Bull uh, of uh, uh, 1455. Uh, the Pope addresses Spain and Portugal and tells them, I now uh, order you to reduce the servitude all infidel people. Uh, 1482, we see Christopher Columbus involved in the transatlantic slave trade in 1482, 10 years before he set sail on his uh, first of four voyages. Um, we see the Moors losing control of uh, uh, Granada, January 2nd, 1492. Uh, then we also look at uh, uh, 1494, the Treaty of Tordesillas uh, of 1494 as well. So these are all very uh, important uh, historical dates, June 7, 1492, the Treaty of Tordesillas, 1502, uh, Spain, right around 1502, the Spanish had important African slaves to the Caribbean islands. And they also, they've conquered uh, African Moors and enslaved some of them. Some of those African Moors are being shipped into uh, some of these Caribbean islands that the the uh the spanish are controlling remember the the portuguese are the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade the spanish are the second ones involved 1517 Bartolome de las casas suggests that uh africans be made uh slaves exclusively he says that the native americans have suffered enough and that they should exclusively enslave the uh african people he talks about saving the souls of native americans and then we know that king charles v is going to sign in uh, uh 1518 
King Charles V signs what's known as the Asiento de Negros, the Asiento de Negros, or the Asiento for short, which was a license issued uh, by Spain to uh, slave traders and slave trader nations to give them a license, to give them the authority to provide the Spanish colonies with um, African captives with African slaves, and uh, what they and and, and it, um, this uh, this allowed for direct routes, uh, direct voyages from Africa to the Spanish colonies, as opposed to them having to stop in Spain first. Also, the Asiento de Negros, which really expands the transatlantic slave trade and increases the need for uh, enslaved African people as well. OK, so this, these are just a few of the things it, it's um, this is um, normally a 10 week online class. But this time around, we're going to do at least 12 classes, probably 13 classes um, we'll do this time around. Uh, and, and we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. So as soon as you register, you can watch the other classes we've done. The classes uh, regularly $130 is on sale, $60. We have the link here in the thread of the broadcast. It's also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So what's a papal bull? Some people may ask the question, what's a papal bull? So in Roman Catholicism, a papal bull is an official letter uh, or document. Uh, the name is derived from the from the uh, lead seal, Bulla, B-U-L-L-A, the lead seal, uh, traditionally affixed to such documents. Since the 12th century Common Era A.D., it was designated, it has designated a letter from the Pope carrying a Bulla uh, that's, that shows the heads of the apostles, Peter and Paul, on one side of the Pope's signature, on one side and the Pope's signature on the other side. So this is what a papal bull is, okay? Uh, it's an official letter or document coming from uh, the Pope. So we're going to see how all this evolves and we see how this is connected to uh, ancient Kemet and the Moors take the, the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt into Europe. We know that Jewish GM James in the book Stolen Legacy uh, talked about how the Moors were the custodians of the ancient Egyptian mystery system. And they take these teachings from the Nile Valley region of Africa into Europe and they bring Europe out of the dark ages, okay? Uh, also, you have the uh, we, we see that the Moors are going to Africanize uh, Europe to to, ver to uh, various extents. They're taking the science, the mathematics. They're taking the uh, architecture, uh, the the medicine. Uh, they're taking the arts. They're taking the music, musical instruments, all this into Europe. OK, the Moors ancestors were known as the Garamantes. Uh, these were black African people living throughout North Africa. Hannibal Barca, who we talked about earlier in the class, Hannibal Barca, the uh, Carthaginian general and the Carthaginians are descendants of the Phoenicians. Hannibal Barca was Garamanti as well as uh, St. Augustine. OK, so we're going to see how all this uh, uh, history comes together, how all these historical figures that we've heard about during different periods of history come together. We'll look at different African civilizations, uh, whether it's Axum, uh, whether it's Namidia, Namidia, which was existed from about 202 BC to 46 BC. Uh, we look at uh, the Great Zimbabwe uh, as well, ancient city of Great Zimbabwe. Uh, in, in, in other um, African civilizations also, definitely Carthage, that's extremely important. Uh, looking at Carthage, which was destroyed by Rome in 146 BC, you have the three Punic Wars that we talk about um, um, in the class as well. So we go through history and we look at all these different uh, aspects of history, look at this chronologically. There are over 200 slides in the class. So over 50 articles that I reference. We have video clips, uh, book references, articles. Uh, one of the things we do within the class is why is Christmas celebrated on December 25th? And this was a, um, a book that I saw at CVS Pharmacy uh, in 2011 called The Life of Christ, The Life of Christ. Uh, the rediscovering how his life, death, and resurrection changed the world, right? And if you read uh, Christopher, uh, if you read Christianity Before Christ by Dr. John G. Jackson, if you read The World's 16 Crucified Saviors by Kersey Graves, it gets into a lot of this information. On page 55 of this book, it, uh, this is why I spent 
twelve dollars for this book because of the information that dropping on on page 55 and this ties into the lectures that i've done dealing with the origins of christmas and why is christmas celebrated on december 25th things like this right i've done a three-hour lecture dealing with ancient kemet the winter solstice and the history of christmas um it says on page 55 it says in christianity's uh early years people debated when jesus birthday should celebrate it some christians were against observing it at all as they did not want jesus compared uh, uh they did not want jesus compared uh to pharaoh and they, they don't say which pharaoh pharaoh is a title not a name pharaoh or nasubiti is a title not a name pharaoh uh and herod uh, whose birthdays were commemorated but in the fourth century common era pope julius the first uh, Pope Julius I made it official. Christ's birth would be uh, celebrated on December 25th. Okay, and that was actually um, it's about uh, four. It's about 430, uh, right around uh, 432 or so. Um, common era that Pope Julius I uh, declares that um, Christmas be celebrated on December 25th. Okay, and then later he's going to uh, state that Jesus' birthday is December 25th. Okay, now now what I say may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you disagree with it or don't like it does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. Okay, so um, it's uh yeah 345 uh 345 common era pope julius the first decrees that uh jesus birthday is december 25th okay but he had no evidence to base this upon now if you i have the book here somewhere hold on uh yeah okay this is um Okay, I've got it around here somewhere, the birth of Christ, but let's continue because I have the new one that they put out for Easter. This new one, uh, I got, uh, it was March of this year, okay, the resurrection of Jesus. Okay, so the uh, December 25th was already considered the birthday of the sun, not the S-O-N, but the S-U-N, okay, what well, once again, what I say may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Just because you never heard it before, disagree with it, or don't like it, does not mean it's not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand what I'm talking about. All right. Okay. And if you if you go to history.com, which is the official website of the History Channel, uh, and just search for Christmas, December 25th, things like this. They have some information there to corroborate what I'm talking about. If you read Christianity Before Christ by Dr. John G. Jackson, which is one of the books we reference in the class, there's a ton of information to corroborate what I'm talking about. Okay. Also, I encourage you to read um, Dr. Shaka Musa Barashango's book, African People and European Holidays and Mental Genocide, book one and book two african people african people and european holidays and mental genocide book one and book two by dr shaka musa barashango you'll see all this stuff largely comes from africa and it's been co-opted by other cultures and they've reinterpreted put their ethnicity on it and the names of of their ancestors things like this and, and rep and represent it to the world as if they created it themselves okay all right so very quickly here and i have to teach this class how do you all like this type of information give us a thumbs up give us a heart give us a like you can register for this class it's on it's regularly 130 dollars on sale 60 dollars as soon as you register there's a ton of archive content that you can start watching as well okay so uh let me continue here uh december 25th was already considered the birthday of the sun not the s-o-n but the s-u-n Using the, using the technology available at the time, uh, ancient astronomers observed that on December 25th, the days started getting longer again. They recognized 
uh, the date as the winter solstice, the winter solstice when the sun is is born again each year. So this deals with astronomy. What determines when Christmas is celebrated is based upon astronomy. The winter solstice occurs. Um, the winter solstice occurs during um, December uh, 22nd, 23rd, 24th. And uh, December 20, December 20th, December 21st, the sun moves into its lowest uh, position. And uh, on December 23rd, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, the, the sun appears not to move. So it says the sun uh, stands still, okay, or the sun is dead for three days. And on December 25th, the sun moves one degree northward, and each subsequent day, uh, starting on December 25th and each subsequent day, there's uh, more and more sunlight. OK, so December 25th in ancient times was looked at as the birthday of the son of God, not the S-O-N, but the S-U-N or the rebirth of the sun. This is based upon astronomy. OK, so uh, December 25th was already considered the birthday of the sun, the S-U-N. Using the technology available at the time, ancient, ancient astronomers observed that on December 25th, the days started getting longer again. December 25th, the days started getting longer again. They recognized the date as the winter solstice. And solstice basically means sun stands still. That's what winter solstice means in Latin. Sun stands still. When the sun is born again each year. The Romans uh, celebrated the birthday of the deity or the god soul invictus s-o-l that prefix soul s-o-l means sun soul invictus which means unconquered sun the romans celebrated the birthday of the un, uh, of soul invictus on december 25th the the day was also recognized as the birthday of the deity mithra okay the sun deity mithra amongst the persians okay and and as the birthday of the deity Attis, the agricultural uh, god Attis in Asia Minor, by choosing December 25th for as the birthday of Yeshua, because the letter J did not exist until 1630 AD. Okay, look at the letter J in the dictionary, especially the etymological dictionary. It takes you back to the Hebrew Yeshua with the Y, because the letter J didn't exist until 1630 AD. The letter J is derived from the letter I. So by choosing December 25th, the church uh, avoided upsetting the masses. No one wanted their festivals canceled. So the church simply combined this new Christian holiday with pagan traditions. OK, so this is from page uh, 55 of um, the life of Christ put out by the American Bible Society. This is the 2011 edition put out by the American Bible Society. Uh, and distributed by Time Life Books, Time Home Entertainment, all right? So they came out with a new edition, not the singing group new edition. They came out with a, a new edition, The Resurrection of Jesus. Now, this was in time for uh, Easter, 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 okay? Easter, and Easter celebrated on the first Sunday following the first full moon following the vernal equinox. This is what determines when Easter is celebrated. Based upon the Gregorian calendar introduced in uh, uh, 15, about 1583, uh, coming out of the uh, Third Council of Trent, which is about 1582. Because it was the Third Council of Trent that determined they were trying to recalculate when to celebrate Easter. So they determined that. Um, Easter would be celebrated on the first Sunday following the first full moon following the vernal equinox. And they had to uh, redo the calendar and introduce the Gregorian calendar. The Gregorian calendar is based upon how long it takes the earth to rotate counterclockwise, counterclockwise around the sun. It takes uh, 365 uh, days, five hours, 48 minutes and about 46 seconds. That's your solar. That's your solar year. OK. That's how long it takes the earth to rotate around the sun counterclockwise. So they moved from the Jelaian calendar to the Gregorian calendar. That, that was a result of the uh, Third Council of Trent of 1582 AD, 
which is one of those 21 ecumenical councils that um, changed the way, uh, changed how Christianity was practiced and what people were taught, what they believed when it came to Christianity, going, going back to the uh, first council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Now, what's interesting here in, 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 this, in this one, the resurrection of Jesus, which came, which came out in, um, this came out in 20, uh, 2022, came out this year, 2022. They have a section here because they've been getting backlash. I know they've been getting backlash because of what, what, what they put in, uh, the 2011 edition, uh, that deals with the life of Christ, because in the next edition of the life of Christ, that informational page 55, they took out of there. OK, the information was correct, but a lot of people can't handle the truth. So what they did. So what they have here in this one, page 67. Is they have this little inset right here. It says pagan mythology. It says pagan mythology and resurrection, the differences. So they have to address it because I know they've been getting so much backlash and I've been using these sources that they put out. To really expose what's going on the videos of me going back to like 2011 i did one uh i spoke with uh one of my teachers professor kaba hiawatha professor kaba hiawatha kamane we did a lecture together in um was that washington dc something like 2012 but it says pagan mythology and resurrection the differences okay so they reference asar aset and heru who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And we deal with all this in the in the 12 week online history class as well. And take all this back to ancient Kemet and, and show you the relationship between ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, the Nile Valley region of Africa. We show you the relationship between that and the United States and, and the formation of the United States and the founding fathers because 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. Okay, so they say um, it has become commonplace to argue that Jesus's resurrection is simply one more example of a common motif in ancient mythology in which a hero dies and rises again. Advocates of this position point to parallels between Jesus and the Greek gods Attis and Adonis or the Egyptian gods Horus and, Os and Horus and Osiris okay well re really Yeshua and the story of Yeshua is a combination of the story of uh Asar the father who you see depicted here in the middle who the Greeks called Osiris and and Horus uh Heru uh heru who the greeks called horus okay it's really a combination of both because heru wasn't the one who was resurrected is is asar or osiris who's resurrected after he was killed by his brother set his brother set uh killed him and cut up his body into 14 pieces 13 of the pieces were recovered by Oset, okay uh or isis and the the 14th piece uh was the phallus the penis which was not recovered so this is why the tekken or the obelisk is erected okay to represent uh resurrection and to represent that 14th piece of asar's body that was not found okay so it's going to be uh heru who avenges the death of his father and kills his uncle set and and resurrects his his, his father asar okay so um advocates of this position point to parallels between Jesus and the Greek gods Attis and Adonis or the Egyptian god Horus and Osiris but a deeper inspection shows the parallels are forced and the resurrection account of Jesus bears little semblance to these mythological fables it's a combination of this the story of Heru and uh Asar it's a combination of those and you look at Gerald Massey, he goes through and lays out numerous similarities between uh, numerous similarities between uh, Heru and uh, Jesus as well and the other crucified saviors also. That's why I read the book uh, Christianity Before Christ by Dr. John G. Jackson or the World's 16 Crucified Saviors. 
so th this goes on to say pagans did not believe in resurrection one early church father and bodily uh resurrection never uh, one one early ch church father said boldly resurrection never crossed their mind um uh the the philosophers on mars hill mocked paul for his okay so this is a misunderstanding because when you look at those uh uh other uh civilizations and things like this they did have a concept of resurrection they did have a concept of resurrection because th their savior was born again each year and their savior uh their birthday was usually either on or be on or around december 25th and they did have a concept of resurrection in egyptian mythology osiris never rose from the dead he ruled the underworld and served as a living king of the dead but uh, but asar asar was resurrected yeah he ruled the underworld but he was still resurrected okay he was his 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 body was put back together okay he, he the the 13 uh pieces were recovered his body was put back together and he's resurrected to rule the underworld okay so he he wasn't resurrected to walk on earth but so what this is this is where they got it from in egyptian mythology osiris never rose from the dead he ruled the underworld and served as the living king of the dead the claim that horus died after a scorpion sting is simply a correct he only became ill and was nursed to health by his mother in greek mythology the god attis was was not resurrected his spirit entered a pine tree hardly a reason, reasonable parallel the overwhelming historical evidence of jesus resurrection in terms of eyewitness and firsthand contemporaneous accounts is a completely different category than legends and fables and mythology they're really stretching there they're really stretching there the overwhelming historical evidence where's your where's your evidence they're really stretching it where's your archaeological evidence would you read christianity before christ but dr john g jackson they're really stretching there okay but they're but there are similarities and he lays them out here in this book there are similarities it's not exactly the same but this is where they th this is where they get this from to create the story of jesus christ born of a virgin birth on december 25th to the virgin mary and then to take it even deeper if you look at um in the the story of uh asar and offset uh and and tony browder deals with this in um now valley contributions to civilization page 95 okay if you look at this and then i gotta get out of here because i'm gonna teach uh Going to teach a brief session of this class how do you all like this type of information you can go ahead and register for this uh online history class uh, it's a 12 week online history course ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade what they didn't teach you in school so we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade uh taking place we do the sessions live all the sessions are archived and recorded so as soon as you register, uh, you can start watching the content. You can join us in this class that uh, I'm about to teach. We, we do this at our online school. It's not here on social media. Um, page 95 of Nonviolent Contributions to Civilization, Tony Browder says, the story of Asara Aset and Heru is the first story in the recorded history of man of a holy royal family, the Trinity, Immaculate Conception, Virgin Birth, and Resurrection evidence of this trinity is known to have existed in ancient nubia as late as 3300 bce before the common era as late as 3300 bce before the common era carved on the walls of the temple of luxor circa 1380 bce are scenes which depict the following you have the annunciation so the lower the bottom portion here uh the panel number one you have the annunciation the netter de Huti, is shown announcing to the virgin all set the coming birth of heru this is the annunciation okay uh you have the um number two you have the immaculate conception the netter neph k-n-e-p-h the netter neph who represents the holy ghost the holy ghost and the netter het heru 
or Hathor um, are shown symbolically impregnating the uh, offset who the Greeks called Isis, okay, by holding ox, which is the symbol of the, the eternal symbol of life, to the nostril of the virgin mother to be. All right. This is the Immaculate Conception. Three, you have the virgin birth, which is the top, the top panel here, the virgin birth. All set is shown uh, sitting on the birthing stool and the newborn child is attended by midwives. All set is, is shown sitting on the birthing stool and the newborn child is attended by midwives. Number four, the adoration. OK, the newborn Heru is portrayed uh, receiving gifts from the three kings or the magi while adored by a host of gods and men okay you ever heard of the adoration and this is where you get the the three kings the three wise men but in uh the book of malachi it doesn't tell you how many wise men it was okay and 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 the three kings the concept of the three kings that comes from the three stars in Orion's belt, Orion the hunter, that constellation of Orion's belt and the uh, star uh, Sirius, which is the brightest star in the east. The star Sirius is in the constellation of um, Canis Major, OK, which is the uh, uh, the big dog. OK, Canis Major, the big dog. And that's the star Sirius, which is it, which is in uh that constellation so you have the big dog and the little dog canis major and canis minor okay in those constellations i have that slide somewhere uh that's in um that uh, that slide is actually in my presentation dealing with the history of christmas the origins of christmas but anyway uh, okay so very quickly here if we look at so they talk about the Houthi, right if we look at this here and we see how the deities from the, the Netter from ancient Kemet influenced the deities from the Greeks and the Romans. We look at page 168 of Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. They, they, they show how the Houthi becomes uh, Hermes uh, amongst the Greeks and Mercury amongst the Romans. OK, but they talk about how. Um, the, uh, OK, so. Uh, the Houthi, the netter of science, writing, measurement, divine articulation of speech and medicine holds in his hands two staffs with entwined snakes. One serpent wears the crown of upper Kemet. The other wears the crown of lower Kemet. The Houthi is referred to as Thoth by the Greeks. OK, so you see the Houthi carrying two staffs with a snake wrapped around each staff. All right. And we know that the Houthi is going to be the one who delivers the Annunciation to the Virgin all set. So then we have two. We have Hermes, uh, Her, uh, Hermes and, and the uh, books of Hermes are crucial to the teachings of Freemasonry as well. OK, uh, Hermes was the Greek equivalent of the Houthi. Uh, he is shown. Uh, uh, he is shown carrying a staff which has two entwined snakes. He is shown carrying a staff which has two entwined snakes. It was called the staff of Hermes. It was called the staff of Hermes, okay? Uh, in Greek mythology, he was associated with wisdom and the hermetic sciences were named in his honor, okay? But also when you look at Freemasonry, the, the books are Hermes, or also referred to as Hermes Trismegistus, Hermes Thrice Great, are, are essential knowledge to those that practice Freemasonry or the Freemasons, okay? Now, number three, you have Mercury. Now, we've all seen Mercury in cartoons, um, it, it, you know, um, uh, cartoons dealing with uh, Roman mythology. We see, we see uh, Mercury amongst the Romans, okay? Uh, Mercury is the Greek version of it should be Roman version, Roman version of Hermes and the Houthi, and he is similar in all aspects. The staff of Mercury carries uh, the staff that Mercury carries is called the Caduceus, the Caduceus, and it has 
been adopted as the universal symbol of medicine. Okay, so we see examples of the Caduceus here, the Arizona Latin uh, American Medical Association. We see the American Medical Association with a stick with a snake wrapped around it. We see the symbol for dentistry, all that. When you research this, the Caduceus, that's, this comes straight out of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. But, but it, it, it goes even deeper than this, okay? Because Mercury is also a messenger god, okay? Mercury is a messenger. And in the uh, story of, so if we look here at this, uh, if we look here at this guide, it breaks down, um, where is it? Mercury, Phoenix, Mercury. Okay. So we see Dahuti. I have it highlighted Dahuti, Hermes, Mercury, divine aspects of those three deities, messenger of the gods and god of science, messenger, right? So it's Dahuti who delivers the Annunciation to the Virgin all set that she is going to give birth to Heru. In the Christian tradition, it's the messenger angel Gabriel who delivers to the Virgin uh, Mary that she's going to give birth to Yeshua. Okay, I say Yeshua because the letter J didn't exist. You can, if you take this back, to when the Helios Biblos or the Sun Book or what you call the Holy Bible was written, the letter J didn't exist. The English language didn't exist. So his name was his name was Yeshua. Okay, so G Gabriel or Gabriel Gabriel does with Mary what Dahuti did with Aset. Where did they get this stuff from? You have to, to under, you know, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene says to understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre existence of existence. To understand Christianity, you have to go back to the Nile Valley region of Africa and you have to go back to ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. This is where this comes from. Now, we've been taught to hate Africa, we've been taught to hate ancient Kemet. You deal with the, the false story of the Exodus. OK, this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. I dealt with this when I when I uh, did my uh, broke down presentation on dealing with uh, the origins of Easter around Easter time. OK, and I know, you know, many of our people are of the Christian persuasion. OK, and as I as I explain to people, I'm not against people who are Christians. OK, because uh, the word Christ which means anointed or anointed one comes from Christos, which is Greek, which comes from the Kemetic Ka-Rest, K-A-R-S-T, Ka meaning spirit, rest meaning to rise. So you have to understand where all this comes from. That takes it back to ancient Kemet. We, we, we keep running away from who we are. To understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre-existence of existence. If we look very briefly here at this uh, uh, article here from history.com, which deals with the Passover, okay? Um, and this is at uh, history.com's official website of the History Channel. Okay, this deals with the Passover. And the Passover deals with the uh, murder of African children also. People don't want to talk about that. But uh, in that area of the world that this is taking place, these were African people. OK, so if you talk about killing the firstborn child under two years old, you ain't talking about killing white children. OK, you're talking about killing African children. So if you read this is from history, the history channel, history.com, they have a ton of information. This is one of the sources we use. We use National Geographic, history.com. There's a ton of sources that we use in these classes that I teach. And I've been teaching this class since 2017. It has it expanded exponentially. They talk about the Gregorian calendar. OK, right here. And we know the Gregorian calendar is a result of um, 1582 when Pope Gregory the 13th introduced. Yeah, he introduced the Gregorian calendar. And that is a, a result of the uh, Third Council of Trent of about 1582, the Third Council of Trent. All right. But if we look at. Um, and this goes this goes through and explains why the Gregorian calendar was created. And uh, the the concern Pope Gregory because this uh, because this concern Pope Gregory because it meant that Easter traditionally.
observed on March 21st, fell further away from the spring equinox or the vernal equinox. Vernal is Latin for spring uh, with each passing year. Also, when you look at uh, the constellation of Virgo, the, so the, the uh, X symbols, the zodiac sign and the constellation of Virgo, Virgo in Latin means virgin. Virgo in Latin means virgin. All this stuff is connected. It goes through various cultures, but it still maintains a lot of its original essence. All of this method. Okay, so read this here. They go through and, and break this down. And they break, explain leap years like this. And, and this was a, uh, 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 a result of the Third Council of Trent. In 1582, when Pope Gregory the Thirteenth introduced his Gregorian calendar, Europe had adhered to the calendar first implemented by Julius Caesar in 46 BC. As I said, they were using the Julian calendar before the Gregorian calendar was introduced. Since the Roman emperor system miscalculated the length of the solar year by uh, 11 minutes, the calendar had since fallen out of sync uh, with the season. So they were celebrating uh, Easter further and further away from the vernal equinox as time went on, going from 46 BC up until the 1500s. They, they were celebrating Easter further and further away from the vernal equinox, which is why they had to recalculate what is why they had to come out with a new camera, um, a new, uh, new, not the camera, new calendar, which was uh, more accurate and Easter would fall uh, closer to the vernal equinox. So Easter is celebrated on the first Sunday following the first on the first Sunday following the first full moon following the vernal equinox. When Easter is celebrated is based upon astronomy. Okay. Uh, six things you may not know about the Gregorian calendar. This is at history.com. So a lot of this they don't teach you in church. Some churches may, but a lot of churches they run away from stuff like this. You have to ask them why. We created astronomy. Why are we running away from what we were created? Okay, so if you scroll down the article Passover, you scroll down and then they talk about about Moses and all this, the, the stuff you see in the movie Ten Commandments with Yul Brenner and all this stuff. Okay. Uh, uh, now, there's a different, okay. Let me, let me give my disclaimer once again. Okay. First of all, we have to understand that world history and religious literature are two entirely different things. World history and religious literature are two entirely different things world history is in world history books okay world history is in world history books religious literature is in religious literature books all right when you look at religious literature this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness just because with my bible right here new king james version this is a study bible I have a devotional Bible in the other room. See, you got to see people sit up in church, amen, and, and amen comes from ancient Kemet also. That's a whole other conversation. See, the difference between a study Bible and a devotional Bible, I have a devotional Bible, King James devotional Bible. That's about 400, 450 pages. My, King, my, my, my new King James study Bible, this is 2,000 pages. And the study Bible has additional information, annotations, word definitions, things like this. The study Bible, this is what you, when you go to Bible study class, this is what you take the Bible study class. You don't take a devotional Bible. You have to get a study Bible. But you have to understand the difference between the two. Okay? If we read, a, if we read from a study Bible, okay, as opposed to just listening to what the pastor says and just hallelujah, and praising God, things like this. If you actually research this, this is why you need a study Bible. This the study Bible also came with a CD-ROM as well. It came with a CD-ROM. Comes with maps, all this stuff in the back of the book. Comes with maps, everything, and it came with a CD-ROM also. I bought this, you know, years ago. When I get this, April fifth, two thousand nine. That's when I got this. So, you know, it came with a CD-ROM. This is for studying. Okay. That's the difference. We all need to, if you, if you read the Bible, you need to get a study Bible. This was $40 when I got it. I got this from Borders Bookstore. It was $39.99 when I got the book. Okay. 
It was $39.99 when I got the book in 2009. You probably get it cheaper on Amazon or something more. You know, first check with your local African American bookstore. All right. But we have to understand the difference. Because if we understand the if we understood the difference between a study Bible and a devotional Bible, it'll clear up a whole lot of confusion. Number one. World history is in religious literature. Uh, world history is in world history books. Okay. You ever you ever wonder? why when you go to historical museums like museums that deal with world history okay and they deal with ancient kemet ancient egypt they deal with china they deal with uh they may have some uh uh history dealing with mesopotamia and things like this you ever wonder why when you go to world with like historical museums especially dealing with ancient history you don't see biblical characters in like ancient museums world history museums generally speaking they may have a biblical section which is probably going to be rare and strange but if they have the biblical section most of what they're going to say is according to the bible according to the bible it says this according to the bible moses did this notice in the bible they don't talk about the years that any of this stuff happened in, in, in the original text. I'm not talking about the annotations. I'm not talking about the notes in the original text of the Bible in the 66 books in the original text. Notice they don't talk about the years that any of this stuff happened. So they didn't have calendars when, when the Helios Biblos was written. So this article dealing with the Passover goes through and talks about the 10 plagues. Talks about when Pharaoh, then the, the say which pharaoh i don't think it i don't think they give the name of the pharaoh maybe they do but usually when they talk about pharaoh they don't say which name pharaoh is a title not a name they go through and talk about the story of moses and and, and all of this right and they talk about the the, the the jews being in egypt and everything okay but then they go through they get past what's in the helios biblos the sun book the bible what you're taught in in Sunday school or what we were taught in catechism school uh, when I was a Catholic because I was Catholic till I was 13 so we went to catechism school on Saturdays taught by the white nuns and they were showing us they were showing us uh, children's books you know that taught about the Bible and all the people in the Bible they show were white people they showed us Moses is white and Mary is white and Jesus is white and and Joseph is white and and and, 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 and the 12 disciples is white all that it was white nuns showing us white images in the Bible and showing us how holy and 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 how all these people are people how all these people are, are to be revered. Okay, it's nothing nothing about African people. But anyway, it says for centuries. Now this may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. I'm gonna post the link right here. You can read this for yourself. Not attacking anybody's religion. What we what we should be talking about is how African people. African history and African spirituality has been attacked. That's what we should be talking about. Okay, so let's look at this here. Questions, they have this section here, the History Channel, history.com, official website of the History Channel. These are, these are Europeans telling you this, what I'm about to share with you. It goes through and says questions of historical accuracy. For centuries, F-O-R, for centuries, scholars have been debating the details and historical merit of the events commemorated during the passover holiday despite numerous attempts historians and archaeologists have failed to corroborate the tale of the jews enslavement in and mass exodus from egypt Historians of different races, archaeologists of different races have failed to corroborate the tale, T-A-L-E, of the Jews' enslavement in and mass exodus from Egypt. Because it's supposed to be about two million of them in total leaving Egypt. And it said that they uh, wandered in the desert for 40 years. Okay, number one. If you have a mass exodus like this from a country, is going to leave an ecological footprint. 
You don't have millions of people that just disappear and there's no evidence of them. There's still going to be archaeological evidence there to this day. You have you, you're going to have a massive fluctuations in irrigation, agriculture, things like this. It's going to throw off the ecology. You got two million people. Then they it said that they wandered in the desert for 40 years. What did two million people eat in the desert for 40 years? What did two million people eat in the desert for 40 years? Where did two million people get water from in the desert for 40 years? Then, okay, let's continue here. Although the ancient Egyptians kept thorough records, no mention is made of an Israelite community within their midst or any calamities resembling the 10 biblical plagues. There is also no evidence of large encampments in the Sinai Peninsula, the fabled site of, of the Jews wandering, or any sudden fluctuation in Israel's archaeological record that would indicate the departure and return of a large population. It would indicate that you, you leave archaeological footprints. You leave ecological footprints. You don't have hundreds of thousands of people or millions of people leaving a society, a mass exodus, and then they arrive in another society and there's, there's no evidence of that. That doesn't happen. What happens in literature, but it doesn't happen for real. A handful of scholars, including century Jewish historian Josephus, have suggested a link between the Israelites and the Hyksos, the shepherd kings, a mysterious Semitic people, possibly from Canaan, who controlled lower Egypt for more than 100 years before their expulsion during the 16th century BC. Most modern academics, however, have dismissed this theory due to chronological cons and a lack of similarity between the two cultures. Okay, read the rest of this here. Now, this is the History Channel telling you this. I would encourage you to take this to your pastor or take this to Bible study class and, and, and ask them some questions. Not to challenge people, but sh should we study the Bible in Bible study class? Shouldn't we study the Bible? But you, you, but if you're going to say that this actually happened, then you're trying to say that it's world history. Well, Where's your evidence? Because when you deal with world history, there's archaeological evidence. You don't you have two million people who exit a country, a nation, and then go into another country, a nation. And it doesn't leave behind archaeological evidence. That doesn't happen. All right. So, uh, and then, now this one right here, this is, a, uh, this is really knock people out. So, we talked about Asara set in Heru, the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Uh, how many people know that in 1949, um, when Dr. King was at uh, Crozier Theological Seminary, he wrote a uh, paper dealing with the influence on Christianity uh, coming from the uh, mystery systems in the mystery religions. But uh, how many people knew about this? There's a, uh, we, we talk about this in the class. And since we're on this topic, I'm just going to bring this up. Um, Pull this up here. It's called the influence of the mystery religions on Christianity. This is 
this was written by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., same Dr. King that during Dr. King Day, oftentimes in the media, they lie to us about the legacy of Dr. King. Dr. King was a revolutionary who, whose legacy is grossly distorted. Um, at Stanford University online, they have the um, King Institute, Stanford University. So they have a lot of his papers there and things like this that he wrote. The Martin Luther King Jr. Research and Education Institute. Um, in 1949, in 1950, November 29th, 1949 to February 15th, 1950, around that time, Dr. King was at Crozier Theological Seminary in Boston. He wrote a he wrote a paper dealing with the influence of the mystery religions on Christianity. The influence of the mystery religions on Christianity. And um, it, it goes through and talks about the influence of Osiris and Isis the influence of Osiris and Isis, who are Asar and Aset. Talks about the influence of the cult of uh, Sybil and uh, Attis as well. Dr. King was deep, trying to tell people. Dr. King wasn't no punk. Dr. King was deep. Dr. King studied history. Dr. King kept abreast of the developments on the continent of Africa and the African liberation movement. In 1957, when Ghana won its independence, Dr. King went to Ghana for a celebration and he went to Ghana and met uh, Kwame Nkrumah. And each year on the anniversary of Ghana's independence, he would go back to Ghana. Uh, Dr. King had a deep respect for Africa and African history and the African liberation movement. Um, so very briefly here, it says that the Egyptian mysteries of Isis and Osiris exerted considerable influence upon early Christianity. And this is Dr. King writing. These two, uh, these two great Egyptian deities who, uh, whose worship passed into Europe were revered not only in Rome, but in many other centers where Christian communities were growing up. Osiris and Isis, so the legend runs, were at one in the same time, brother and sister, husband and wife. He's correct. But Osiris was murdered, his coffin body being thrown into the Nile. And shortly afterwards, the widowed and exiled Isis gave birth to a son, Horus, or Heru. The Greeks called him Horus. Meanwhile, the coffin was washed up on the Syrian coast and became miraculously lodged in the trunk of a tree. This tree afterwards a chance to be cut down and made into a pillar in the place at Byblos. Byblos, okay. Now, Byblos is the Phoenician capital where the early Christians go to to get the papyrus to write the uh, Bible or the or the Helios Byblos, okay, or Bublos, all right. Uh, ancient city Lebanon. Uh, we'll look at this briefly here. Then I got to jump jump off teacher's class. Okay, who still needs to register for this uh, twelve week online history class? Teach ancient Kemet. The Moors under my offer. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in the school. We deal with thousands of years of history. This is just a brief overview of the type of information we deal with in the class. Because I'm gonna get wrapped up in in this session here and, and forget to teach the class. Um, this is, I mean, this is what I do. Okay, so if we look at this here, uh, this tree afterwards chanced uh, to be cut down and made into a pillar in the palace at Bublos, Bublos, and there is, and there Isis at length found it. Now, after recovering uh, Osiris or Asar's dismembered body. Isis restored him to life and installed him as king in the netherworld, the underworld. Meanwhile, Horus, because uh, he takes the position as ruler of the underworld after Horus, Heru avenges the death of his of his um, uh, avenges the death of his father Asar by killing his brother Set. Okay, now meanwhile, Heru, having grown to manhood, reigned on earth, later becoming the third person of this great Egyptian trinity. Now, this is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. writing this. He wrote this in 1949. And 
the records of both Herodotus and Tark, we find that there was a festival held each year in Egypt, Kemet, celebrating the resurrection, the resurrection of, Os of, of Osiris. While Herodotus fails to give a date for this festival, Plutarch says that it lasted four days, giving the date as the 17th day of the Egyptian month Hathor, Hathor, uh, which, which was Het Heru, the deity Het Heru, the Greeks called a Hathor, which according to the Alexandrian calendar used by him corresponded to November 13th. Other Egyptian records speak of another feast in honor of all the dead when such lamps were lit, which was held about November 8th. It is interesting to note that the Christian feast of all souls in honor of the dead. Okay, so this 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 deals with All Souls Day and All Hallows Eve that deals with the origins of Halloween. Okay, it is it's interesting to note that the Christian feast of all souls in honor of the dead likewise falls at the beginning of November. Okay, so you have uh, October thirty first and November first with the with the boundaries between the living and the dead become blurred okay according to um the europeans uh, uh, uh like the celtics and things like this um they, they believe that between november between october 31st and november 1st the boundaries between the living world and the spiritual world became blurred okay it is interesting to note that the christian feast of all souls in honor of the dead likewise falls at the beginning of november and in many countries lamps and candles are burned all night on that occasion there seems little doubt that this custom was identical with the egyptian festival the festival of all saints which is held one day before that of all souls all saints day all souls day the festival of all saints which is held one day before that of all souls is also probably identical with it in origin. Uh, this still stands as a festival in the Christian calendar, and thus the Christians unconsciously perpetuate the worship of Osiris in modern times. However, this is not the only point at which the religion of Osiris and Isis exerted influence on Christianity. There can, there can hardly be any doubt that the myths of Isis had a direct bearing that see this is see see this is why i get infuriated i go to dr king day celebrations and i hear people who mean well i know they have good heart they mean well but i can tell by the information they put forth about dr king they've never read dr any of dr king's writings they never read any of the five books that dr king wrote this is dr martin luther king jr writing this not dr richard king Dr. Martin Luther King, there can Dr. King goes on to say there can hardly be any doubt that the myth of Isis had a direct bearing on the elevation of Mary, the mother of Yeshua or Jesus. To the lofty position that she holds in Roman Catholic theology, as is commonly known, Isis had two capacities with which her worshipers warmly commended her for firstly she was pictured as the lady of sorrows weeping for the dead osiris and secondly she was commended as the divine mother nursing her infant son horus former capacity she was identified uh with the great mother goddess demeter d-e-m-e-t-e-r who's mourning for parasophone uh, uh, per, a person, P E R S E F O N E, P H O N E, I should say, was the main feature in the uh, Eleusinian uh, mysteries. In the latter capacity, Isis was represented in tens of thousands of statuettes and paintings holding the divine child in her arms. This is where you get the black Madonna and child from that was worshiped all throughout europe before you had the decolon the, the, before you had the colonized version or the decolorized version of the white mary and jesus this is this is what dr king's breaking down in the latter capacity isis or Osset was represented in tens of thousands of statuettes and paintings holding the divine child in her arms now when christianity triumphed 
we find that these same paintings and figures became those of the Madonna and child with little or no difference. Well, the difference was they became white. He, he's being modest. The difference was they went from black to white. They went from African to European. In fact, archaeologists are often left in confusion and attempting to distinguish the one from the other. Well, the way you distinguish one from the other is the white ones are the ones European created. That's how you distinguish ones from the others. The white ones are the ones Europeans created because Europeans were worshiping African people uh, and a lot of the deities were African. Things like this. When you study Greek mythology, it tells you that Zeus came from Ethiopia. Zeus, who was the king of the king of the gods in, in Greek mythology, it tells you Zeus came from Ethiopia. OK, read, read this full paper here. This is by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. The, the, the I have a dream, Dr. King. This is this is who wrote this. OK, this is at Stanford University's the, uh, uh, the Martin Luther. King Jr. Research and Education Institute. They have one of his papers there that you can read because I listen what people say about Dr. King. I tell they 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 have not studied Dr. King. They're just going by just just simple Simon nonsense they see um, in the media. That, I don't know where they're getting this nonsense from. The influence of the mystery religions on Christianity. Dr. King wrote this in 1949. The influence of the mystery religions on Christianity. Okay, so we take it. We take it to this right here, all right? Asar, Aset, and Heru, but we're going to, we deal with the, the Black Madonna and Child, which comes from Asar, Aset, and Heru, okay? And the Black Madonna, the statues of the Black Madonna and Child all throughout Europe that is still there today. As you have a rise in European powers, as they're coming out of the Dark Ages, um, in the uh, as you come out of the dark ages in the 1300s, going into uh, well, the late late 1300s, because you had the uh, the black death of bubonic plague 1347 to 1400. So, as they're coming out of the dark ages, uh, the early 1400s, and they start to conquer people's lands and they start to explore and colonize, you're going to have uh, a rise in European powers, you start having a rise in the dominance of the European phenotype as becoming the desired phenotype, as being projected in um, in imagery, in statues, in paintings, okay? And you have the decolorized version. Uh, so it goes from being the black Madonna and child to just the Madonna and child. And you have the decolorized version of it, all right? But when we look at, um, let's see, do I have it here? Um, okay, so if we look at, page uh 90 or 91 what is it 90 or 90 90 91 of renoko rashidi's book black star the african presence in early europe and this is a um book we use in the class 1991 he has pictures of statues of the black madonna and child that he took uh in in uh switzerland poland uh, uh statues and paintings that he took in Switzerland, Poland, Spain, and uh, Luxembourg, city Luxembourg, okay? They were worshiping African people. They were worshiping African people. They had, I dare say it, that many Europeans have more respect for the African woman than many African Americans have today for the African American woman. They were, they were showing African people as their savior before you have the rise of white supremacy, okay? Before, but but when the Moors go in in 711 AD, this is what, they, they have these statues. The Moors didn't bring statues of the Black Madonna child. They were already there, which comes from Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Dr. King lays out in his paper the influence on Christianity from the mystery religions. So here, page 89, uh, Renoko shows a uh, painting uh, in Moscow, the Kremlin in Moscow, Black Madonna and Child. This statue here in uh, Montserrat, Spain, 
you got this then uh the black virgin of paris paris france okay uh our lady of the pillar gothic cathedral in france charters france this is all throughout europe then when you deal with um paraisodos the grove of isis and i'm going to see if i can find this quickly here uh this ties into notre dame So Notre Dame means Our Lady. I want to see if I can find this quickly here. Um, okay, this deals. Okay, this is some stuff from Router. Okay, the African influence. Okay, so this is. Um, this is from brownwatch.com. It deals with um, let me see. I want to find this some okay, this is stuff from Browder that I want to find right quick. Um Just one second. There's a some of this information came out when Notre Dame Cathedral caught on fire. Let me see if I can find this right quick. Hold on there. No, that's not what I want. So basically, um, Notre Dame means Our Lady, and the Notre Dame Cathedral was was built on the remains of two temples. One of them was dedicated to Isis. Let's see here, the citation that I want for this. have that bookmarked in a uh, Firefox I had some articles on that bookmark but uh But I have to um, have to go deep and find that information. Because when you search for, they they show the um, the uh, terrorist organization. I'm going to 
to do with goddess Isis. Not, not the terrorist organization. We look at this article here from CNN. Not the articles I'm trying to. Uh, I had one CNN that talked about how uh, Notre Dame was built on uh, remains of uh, a temple dedicated to ISIS. But if we look at this right here. Okay, this is from CNN.com. Ancient uh, sarcophagus found under Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, March 16th, 2022. So it came out this year. Ancient sarcophagus. Okay, those are the, the painted coffins. Uh, ancient sarcophagus. Oh, they're trying to sell something. Ancient sarcophagus found under Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris. Okay, so this is this uh, was written by Reuters, which is one of the main um, news wires, Reuters, and it was picked up by CNN. Archaeologists have found an ancient lead, uh, lead sarcophagus under Notre Dame Cathedral, along with fragments of a rude, uh, along with fragments of a rude screen offering uh, a new insight into the history of the building, which is currently under reconstruction after a devastating fire in 2019. Notre Dame, which dates back to uh, the 12th century uh, AD, commissioned the excavation uh, works inside the cathedral as a precautionary measure before the installation of a scaffolding needed to restore a 100 meter high wooden uh, roof ridge okay now the the floor of the transcript uh crossing has revealed remains of remarkable scientific quality the excavation site lies under a story uh, under a stony layer that dates from the 18th century but some laws go back as far as the 14th century and some even uh, the early 13th century, the culture ministry said. Archaeologists say the uh, lead sarcophagus probably belonged to a high dignitary and said it could date back to the 14th century, uh, which it confirmed would make it a spectacular find. Now, the excavation also revealed a pit immediately below the cathedral which was likely to have been made around 1230 AD when Notre Dame or Notre Dame, one of the oldest examples of French Gothic was under construction. Um, Okay, I gotta find my sources on that. I have articles on that. I just gotta have to find where they are. You know what? Let me check uh, Britannica. Uh, let me try. 
try to close out some of these ads here. Okay, they have they have information on um, they have information on Notre Dame, um, the Encyclopedia Britannica's uh, website also. Notre Dame Cathedral. The cathedral was initiated. Uh, by Maurice de Sully, Bishop of Paris, who about 1160 AD conceived the idea of converting into a single building, larger scale, the ruins of two earlier basilicas, the ruins of two earlier basilicas. One of those was a, a temple dedicated to Isis. The foundation stone was laid by Pope Alexander III in 1163, and the higher altar was consecrated in 1189. We look at this, let me look at this source here. Okay. Not that familiar with that, not to find it later. All right. So hey, um, you can join us. Uh you can register for this 10-week online class. Uh, we'll post a link here. We have the bundle pack, so you get both of my classes for a hundred dollars, it's regular thirty dollars. This class is on sale, sixty dollars regularly. Uh, one hundred thirty dollars. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. How do y'all like this type of information? Give us a thumbs up. Give us a heart. Give us a like. Um, so you can register for right now. I'm about to jump off and and teach uh, um, a brief session of this class. Now, as soon as you register, we have about twelve sessions. That what well, was not twelve? We have uh, ten sessions already archived that you can watch. Okay, and we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. So a year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire class. All right. Then on uh, normally on Sundays, uh, the class I teach is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. And we deal with history from uh, 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase and the Haitian Revolution uh, through uh, to, to, to the Civil War, Reconstruction. Uh, World War One, World War Two, Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power Movement. We have both classes uh, on sale for hundred dollars. So you click right here and uh, register for both classes. Register here for both classes, and it takes you here. Summer bundle pack. Uh, it's on sale, hundred dollars. It's over three hundred dollar value uh, that you get. All right, and those in the Dayton, Ohio area, um, I'll be at the. Uh, Dayton African American Festival, uh, African uh, African American Cultural Festival, uh, Saturday August twentieth through uh, Sunday August twenty first. Okay, so when you support the African History Network, you register for the classes. You uh, you know support us through Cash App or PayPal. That helps cover expenses because it's not free. I have to pay for my vendor booth. I got to pay to get there. Um, I have to um, rent a car. Um, um you should have expenses uh, to get there so i'll be a vendor there okay so you you all can come check me out uh at my vendor booth also all right and i'll be doing presentations at my vendor booth uh we'll have my, my dvd lectures there let me see i'm trying to find the uh website where is it here
Okay, here's their website. And they're on Facebook also. So they get about, uh, on average, 13,000 people coming out over those two days to the festival. It's a free festival. All right. Uh, it's not free to be a vendor, but it's a free festival. And they're going to have everything. Michelle Lay is performing this year also. Uh, so the website is uh, daacf.com, daacf.com. It's an African-American cultural festival. Uh, this is their website, 16th Annual Dayton, Ohio, African-American Cultural Festival. Uh, so they're going to have a community awards. They have a fashion show, storytelling. They have African dance, live music. They have R&B, hip hop, uh, all different types of things like that. Kids activities, stilt walkers, vendors, and more. The Dayton, um, let's see, 16th Annual Dayton African American Cultural Festival, live music, African drumming, gospel, jazz, R and B, blues, hip hop, dancers, live performances, and more. The Dayton African American Cultural Festival Inc. provides a space for people to gather to celebrate the richness of the African American cultural experience and uplift the communal uh, family through activities that promote culture, art, education, and health awareness. So Saturday, August 20th, 2022, it's 12 noon, to 8 p.m. It's at Island Metro Park, 101 East Helena Street in Dayton, Ohio. Okay, they have another flyer here. We have the flyers on our uh, Facebook fan page, the African History Network, and my personal page, Michael M. Hotel. Sunday, August 21st, 12 noon to 6 p.m., same location. The annual Dayton African American Cultural Festival is a two-day citywide uh, family event to bring the richness of African-American experience in the Dayton and surrounding communities. The Dayton African-American Cultural Festival holds uh, hosts many different cultural experiences, African village, drumming, storytelling, storytelling, arts pavilion of paintings, visual uh, displays, authors and literature, education, job center, Dayton High School alumni directories, uh, music that have live R&B, gospel, hip hop, jazz, blues performances, all right? Then they have a uh, visit the authentic African village. Okay, they have all this there, all right? So check this out. Um, this is uh, from pre previous year or years, this festival. So we'll have information on the homepage of our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, when I get there and find out where my booth is, get, well, get my booth set up, because I have a tent. I have to set up my booth, all that stuff. When I get there and set it up, we'll post on our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Um, I'll post where I'm located. So those in the surrounding area, those in Michigan, those in Wisconsin, those in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, you can all come to this two-day festival it's free bring the family and come check out check check me on my vendor booth as well all right if you want to support the african history network and what we do and also this will help cover expenses of running the african history network and when i have to travel like going to dayton ohio because i have to rent a car as well to do all this is number of expenses i've already i've already paid for my vendor booth but i just got to cover other expenses you can support us uh, one, uh, through uh, registering for the online classes. Two, through Cash App or PayPal. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. Also through our, uh, uh, through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. And, and uh, we have the information on the whole page of our website. When you go to Cash App, it... Uh, when you go to our cash app account our cash app account uh our official account dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w when you go to it it says michael and shows my picture there okay so we have the link here on our website cash app these other ones here are fake african history network cash app accounts that's not us ours it's dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w when you go to it, it says michael and shows my picture there i'm trying to get these other fake african history network cash app accounts shut down and then if you click on the link, it takes you here. It says, Michael, this is ours. You can scan the barcode. Okay, that's our official Cash App account. So that helps us keep doing the research. Uh, it helps when we have to travel. You can scan this right now with your phone. And uh, 
uh, you can support us through Cash App, okay? Um, because this helps us keep doing the research, finance the radio show, um, finance the research. Even when I teach the online classes, I have to pay the two digital platforms that I teach the online classes for. So I have to pay for those each month, pay for the subscriptions to the news outlets that I use as well. Okay, so we definitely appreciate the support. All right. Okay, look, we have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And um, you can register for the classes. We'll talk to you next time. I'm about to jump on and, and teach uh, an abbreviated class. As soon as you register, you can watch the other, the previous uh, sessions of this course that I've taught also. All right, remember, right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till.